Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Volpe Create Show, the weekly talk show about video games and creative technology. I am your host, Chris Volpe, joined as always by Baby, who's right here in my lap, Burp. Uh, Pumpkin, who is making a ruckus back there like she always does, and Mr. Lucas. How are you today? Oh, I am doing swell. A little tired, but glad it's almost the weekend. You say that every week. I do. <laughs> I'm always tired. I have a horrible sleep uh, schedule, but we won't talk about that. We can work on that. We can work on that <laughs> offline. True, true, uh, true. And, of course, every week uh, I am joined by a fabulous special guest. Um, this week's guest is an old friend of mine from the game dev community here in beautiful Columbus, Ohio, which is actually beautiful. Sometimes I say that, and it's not beautiful, but it's beautiful today. Um, so we have uh, Duke. Duke, how are you today? Good, how are you? Good. So uh, before we get started, why don't you just let folks know a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm Duke. I'm a uh, game developer, uh, and I have my own uh, studio, Smiling Cat Entertainment, uh, through which I've been uh, learning and practicing game development for, uh, what, now, thir uh, 12, 13 years. Yeah, uh, yeah, you you have been uh, working on as long as I've known you. You've been working on projects. Um, you were one of the the sweet lord, mm. my, my cat. Uh, you were one of the early earliest game dev. Uh, Cog is our our game dev meetup group. Um, folks that's been working on projects, but also uh, you release like you finish projects and you get them out there. Um, so what, what got you into the game space? Cause I know you're, uh, you're a devel developer by, by trade, but what got you into the game side of things? Well, uh, it's actually the game side of things that got me into the developing, uh, kind of came full circle. Uh, I was introduced to video games at a very early age, uh, still a toddler, I think around three years old. And one night uh, after my bedtime, there was a big ruckus downstairs, a bunch of uh, you know, adults uh, playing with my parents on the Atari 2600. And I kind of wandered down and um, you know, kind of, you know, because they woke me up and everything and wound up uh, playing a few rounds, wound up uh, winning a few rounds of uh, video pinball in the 2600 before I got uh, sent back to bed. And uh, kind of got into playing the Atari 2600 since then. Um, and then when I got into grade school, we had uh, you know, kind of some TRS 80s that cycled through the various schools in the school district, TRS 80 color computers. And they kind of got us started basic programming on them. And I, I realized that, you know, that was what I was going to need to make the games uh, for, for the Atari 26, you know, for the, well, for. Well, I was going to need to learn to make games for Atari 2600 and other machines, and this kind of snowballed from there. Awesome. Did you ever make a game for the 2600? Uh, no, I've not made a game for the uh, 2600. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know there has been a, uh, we've seen it at GDEX um, the past probably five years, where there's been a, a growth of people making games for retro consoles. Uh, we've had folks that have done 2600 games. Uh, there's a group that comes in and does uh, Game Boy games. So they, they reflash the Game Boy cartridge and then install new games on it that are you know, newly created games, which you play on a Game Boy. So I always thought that was uh, kind of a, I don't know why, you know, just it, the interest in replicating older styles of games um and and having the the feeling because you can play you know like game boy in particular or any of the old consoles you can just get emulators right but uh there's something about holding the game boy in your hands i think i still have a game boy somewhere around this this joint um so uh you you've been working on smiling cat for what 12 or 13 years um which was you know like i i hate to say side business because i mean we're all we all wear multiple hats in the indie space. Right. Um, but it's a fair description of what I've been doing up until earlier this year. Because uh, yes, I had a I had another full time job, as you said, doing software development. You know, kind of like I said games got me into software development. You know, software development in general. You know, started you know it was paying the bills and everything, and now I've kind of reached a point where 
you know, I kind of wanted to do what I originally set out to do. So. Yeah. So you and I talked, um, when you were thinking about making that, that change, that's a, that's a big step moving from full-time big boy job to taking on your, your side business as your, as your full thing. Um, what made you want to do that? And I mean, how do you think, how do you think you're doing so far? So what made me want to do that? It's you know, kind of, you know, same old, same old, you know, corporate you know, nonsense, everything that you deal with uh, perennially, uh, you know, kind of work, working you know, for development for you know, a big company and everything. And you know, that was kind of wearing on me. And, you know, the most recent round of performance evaluations kind of came around and like getting like a stellar performance valuation. And yet, you know, they didn't, there, there was like no reward in it, you know, basically at the end of the day. Sure. And, and like I said, it's, I've wanted to do this for a long time. So it's like, well, you know, I can continue working for this company where I know that year after year, I'm not really going to get what I want out of it. Or I can, you know, go and actually make the leap and do what I, you know, originally set out to do and, and start doing that on a full time basis. I mean, that's, it's a big move. You feeling good about it? Uh, yeah, so far. Uh, there's certainly been some challenges along the way. Um, so, but um, so far, uh, hanging in there. Yeah, so a lot of the people that, that watch the show and, um, you know, are a part of the community and stuff, they're always interested in the process of getting started in game development or in creating your own games or businesses that's that's always a big thing so um that's one of one of my interests because you know i it's it's been 11 years now with multivarious and i came from uh osu the ohio state university as in the medical center so you know large corporation i'd been at osu in varying capacities for like 13 years at that point um and it's uh it is it's a transition like we we came in way back when we were at the the tech deck you know because uh we both live in in columbus area um here in ohio but uh our way back when we were in dublin with our uh game dev group um and i started doing this full time like i didn't have multivarious didn't have clients really or anything i just sort of was like i am gonna go and try this full time and see what we can do and i just showed up i remember uh january 2nd um because I, I made the i made the final decision uh during that like christmas new year's period uh and so january 2nd i just came into our office and i just treated it like a full-time job even though we didn't really have clients or anything i just went in and i started doing it and you know 11 years later we're we're here so how is how is that transition been for you did you just wake up now in the morning and you just make sure you do your work like what's it what's it look like running your own business full-time yeah I, I like the day after my last day at my uh, full-time job i woke up you know logged in and you know started you know, just doing stuff for smiling cat full-time and it, you know that's just been the way of it for uh, it's been almost six months now yeah. Do you uh, do you find that you are pretty uh, self self motivated? That you're able to keep yourself on task? Uh, yeah, generally. Um, I mean, the, there's days where you know you just there's distractions and, and things like that, and the, but then there's also days where you're like totally in the zone, and completely knock it out of the park, and you just aim to have more of those more of those days than than the ones where you're distracted. Um, yeah. Did you, uh, before you, you started, before you like left, were you working remotely from COVID? Had you been working remote from home? Actually, I've been working remotely long before uh, the pandemic. Okay. So uh, you're, you're used to the home workspace then? Yes. Yes. In fact, it, it was kind of funny, kind of almost like a, I don't know if you call it like a Noah's Ark kind of thing or whatever, but like, a year or two before 
the pandemic was when I did the big remodel on the home office. It, you know, it made it all like really nice and everything uh, in, in the way I wanted it. So time really paid off, especially once the pandemic hit. It's like, well, yeah, at least got like nice digs to you know, yeah, to work from. Yeah, I just uh, I would show you, except my the rest of my house is still a mess. I just moved into a new apartment, but um, one of the things that I did last week as I was unpacking was I cleaned my work desk off so that it's it's nice and clean. There's still a couple things I want to rearrange, but uh, having a nice uncluttered work space is, I mean, it really is amazing just how, how much better you feel when you sit down to get to work. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I kind of make a point, like whenever I finish up like a major project or a major milestone and everything, I just take a few moments, just clear all that clutter away and say, okay, we're starting on something fresh now. Yeah, that that's a good plan, man. I, I, mine's not nearly as structured. It's usually just like when it starts to look like I'm a hobo living in a, a room, I go and start to clean it up. But um, hey, sweetie. Uh, so I want to jump to, and we can we can jump around as we chat. That's This is all just, you know, and if people in the audience have something they want to ask, feel free to ask it. But uh, I want to talk about uh, one of your games, D Hoarder, which is, uh, well, you're, you're on D Hoarder 2 now, right? So yes. you, you've had uh, the original and the sequel, but that was one of those games when um, when I first heard about it, I was like, what in the hell are you talking about? Like, it, it, <laughs> you're cleaning up a house? What is this? And there's like aliens or something? Uh, <laughs> but for years and years, it was one of the games that um, came to GDEX, and you always had this like really crazy booth that was really fun. Uh, and there always seemed like there was uh, people at the booth playing the game and really like liking it. So I, I just I'm just curious where did where did D Hoarder come from and <clears throat> where <clears throat> where is that now? Well, D Hoarder, uh, the original D Hoarder was a game jam entry for Little Dari 26, and the theme that was decided on was minimalism. So after, after some thinking, I came up with a game about minimalizing your lifestyle. It's like things like, you know, the, the orders show were kind of big back then and everything. Uh, so I just made it a game about clearing out junk. It just had a really simple base mechanic to it. And it kind of resonated out there. And, you know, some streamers picked it up. Um, you know, uh, Rockley Smile I picked it up. Um, a couple of others and played it. Um, I kind of offered some humorous commentary and everything. So kind of after I wrapped up my other projects I had in flight, I was like, you know, I should really take and run with this a little more. So that's kind of how Beholder 2 got started. And yeah, it, it, it became a, a pretty big project. Um, and there's been you know, a couple of times where it's been you know, kind of put on hold for a little bit, but, you know, always kind of came back to it and kind of the, Working full time at Smiling Cat has given me an opportunity to really uh, start fleshing it out uh, a lot and start making it really be the game that I want it to be. Yeah, yeah. I um, I know you've got uh, it's not on early access, right? On Steam, it's just I think you have a place like a storefront on it, but you can't buy it yet, correct? Or can you buy it? Right. There's it's it's incoming soon on uh, on Steam. So yeah, not early okay. access yet. Uh, although I do plan on, uh, I'm not sure what form it's going to take yet, but I do want to have some sort of uh, a closed alpha here very uh, shortly for it, where you know, people can start you know, checking it out. It's like some of the Central Ohio uh, audience here has kind of had a chance to check it out, but that, that's the only audience that's really had a chance to kind of look at this game. So I kind of want to start getting it in front of more people they're kind of building interest in it and everything and you know see see what we can build out of it uh yeah that's that's awesome i know um like i guess like people that i've seen play it uh have really liked it and i've played it a little bit and i've played some of the early versions both of one and two while you're working on it but i think when people see it and like i said you can see it on steam for those listening d hoarder too um but yeah when you look at it it just it is like literally just a room filled with crap that you have to sort of take care of and, and, and clean up. Um, what kind of, 
I'm kind of curious about the challenges just design wise that you had about that game because that's that's a lot of items in a space like that that just when you look at it it just feels like it would be a programming nightmare yeah uh, like yeah there's certainly some things you have to do to get the physics performance uh kind of at the, at the level you need it um kind of making it, sure that the is this in item, unity is uh it? yes this is in unity okay that's what I thought. So it's just using the built-in uh, physics uh, engine uh, at this point. Um, probably will will stay that way. It's been sufficient so far. Uh, <clears throat> and just making sure that you know the items that there are a lot of are kind of optimized. Uh, you know, kind of using the fewest number of polygons that 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 you can and the simplest colliders that you can with them to to make sure that they're uh, performant. And then also, if the game kind of has a custom zone-based system where the physics are only active, even though you could see the objects graphically, the physics are only active in like your immediate area. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you have you messed around with this in VR at all? Uh, actually, I have a little bit. Uh, long time ago, I had a friend who uh, lent me an Oculus uh, Rift uh, dev kit, and I kind of hooked it up with it. It, it, it. it was pretty immersive, and I've actually been start, I've been tuning the game slowly for being able to release it as a uh, VR experience. Yeah, I think this could be like a really fun VR. Uh, I have VR on my mind because... Um... The PlayStation 2 VR was uh, a lot of information was just announced um, like over the past week. And I've been talking to, about it with my students and stuff. Um, and in at GDEX before, I think COVID kind of killed it a little bit. But before COVID at GDEX, there were always a bunch of really awesome VR games. And we've been kind of slowly trying to build up the the VR space back up at, at GDEX. Uh, but I, I feel like this is one of those games that could fit in as like a fun group game or like party game where you take turns or something, uh, playing it with a group. Um, yeah. So, uh, so you're working on D hoarder two. Uh, are there other projects that you're working on as well? Or are you trying to keep yourself locked in on one thing? Uh, yeah, that's the only project I'm actively working on right now. Um, as I, like, aside from like maintenance updates and such for uh, you know, prepare for work, my most recently released game. Oh yeah, how I totally forgot because that that was pretty. Uh, oh, prepare. I'm looking this up on. Because um, that's pretty uh, new, right? You just released that. Yeah, August fourth. Yeah, so it was, went in early access last November and then was released August 4th. And that was a revamp of a mobile title that I had done uh, previously for uh, for Android and iOS. That's awesome. How, how's that going? Are people liking it? Uh, the people who play it like it. Um, however, <laughs> I've had uh, some challenges getting it in front of people to play it. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about that for a second because that is something that we I talk about a lot with in various things. Is just particularly on Steam, man. The discoverability of products on Steam is just so it's really hard. And I believe it was I think it was 2018. I want to say where Steam they released like their annual you know info about the Steam store, and they said that half of the games that were on Steam were released in 2018 and it's just like how how can you find anything if it if every year you know i don't think it's maintained that momentum but still if in one year half the games available came out in that year that's just that's a lot of games man and it's not like steam was a new store in 2018 it had been around for a while so how do you do you do any um marketing efforts or or reach outs or how do you how do you uh, surf the market? Uh, well, yeah, I try to do what I can with, you know, with the budget that I have. So, you know, like advertising campaigns or anything, but I've been you know, trying to reach out to streamers I, and you know, seeing, you know, who is you know, seeing who will play it and uh, gotten a couple of streamers to play it that way. Uh, but yeah, just can't get that, you know, that kind of 
critical mass going to you know, kind of kind of push it forward. Uh, and that's kind of unfortunate because, like I said, people who played the game really like it. I mean, we talked to you know, Caleb. Caleb is probably the, the biggest fan of, of, of the game. Oh, really? Um, Caleb, you know? Yeah. 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 I don't know if he's on, if he's watching our stream or not. Um, uh, but, um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, I guess what is, when you're, when you're working on your projects, like what is something that you wish, uh, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, but like you wish you were better at, or like could get a better handle on, you know, is it marketing? Is it like, what are the things that you as a developer, you as a business owner making these things just wish that, like, you know, that you could be better at or, or that your products or whatever. Definitely the marketing and business side of things. Um, yeah. You know, I've been, always been a really strong technical person. And, you know, in recent years, I've you know, come, come a long ways in, uh, on the artwork side and everything, but still, you know, being able to just achieve anything with like you know marketing and you know, kind of in in business has kind of been elusive. Yeah, that is that is one of the challenges. I mean, we we try to navigate that both for the products we make as well. I mean, GDEX is probably the thing we spend the most money on marketing wise. Um, and and it's a challenge because like we we're trying to navigate social media advertising. Uh, we do radio ads for GDEX, which probably doesn't I would imagine does not work very well for uh, you know games on Steam. We've never done a radio ad for a game on Steam, um, and I don't think have we ever. I don't think I've ever heard a video game radio ad. I don't think. But um, but then you know so I think social media is nice. Because there are some ways that you can um, you can navigate social media in a cost-effective way, but still you are fighting against just waves and waves of just like junk games and junk ads. And, you know, there's all those ads on Facebook that show the game and the game is nothing. Like when you click it and go to the actual game, the game is nothing like the ad uh, is. Oh, yeah. um, and it's 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 hard. I know Steam many years ago said that they were going to work on uh, some changes for their discoverability, and I think they ended up uh, changing some of the uh, Steam Greenlight uh, processes. But that was about it. And pretty much it just became, well, now you just pay the two hundred dollars or whatever, and you can get on Steam. I was like, that's not really that doesn't really fix the problem, guys. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I think you're right. I in the in the grand scheme. Well, let me t take a step back here for a second. What kind of games, like when you're not making games, what kind of games do you enjoy playing personally and being involved in? Uh, yeah, personally, like I play a lot of like building kind of games, building simulation kind of games. Uh, Factorio would be like one of my favorites. Um, you know, Satisfactory, which is you know, kind of takes takes that and formula and makes it uh, 3D, kind of combines it with uh, art a bit. Um, yeah, things like, uh, you know, a while back I, I used to be into Minecraft, um, you know, when I just want to, like, zone out and you know, be uh, brain dead about something, a good incremental game here and there. Yeah. So it, it sounds like the uh, the really sort of crunchy sim game design things are what gets you excited yeah um uh, yeah also, I, I, like, oh, go ahead sorry also like a, a good arcade game like uh prepare for war uh it, well uh, yeah it's um i've got like an arcade cabinet uh built uh here that you know that i just i just love so you know, like any of the old retro stuff too so oh nice yeah uh we we I was debating buying one of those like meme meme arcade cabinets for a bit, but I was like, I don't need another thing in my house that's just gonna take up space. Um but yeah, I uh I haven't played I used to be really into a lot of the more simulation 
style games like SimCity, uh, Civilization. Um, but for whatever reason, I sort of veered away. And maybe it's just because over time I've drifted from um, like PC games more to console games. And so you don't really see those as much. Um, but I, oh, it looks like we're getting a suggestion for Factorio for, uh, or Satisfactory maybe for Game Club, which is a, I don't know if you know, I started a game club, which is like a book club for games. So every, uh, every month I post a new game for us to all kind of play as a group. Um, this month's is Until Dawn for Spooky October, because I've never played that game. Um, but yeah, maybe we could choose one of those games for, for Game Club. Thank you for the suggestion there. Uh, but uh, I, I think there is... We had this uh, discussion internally uh, about uh, a game we were working on uh, well, actually, I mean, it, we, it was about Hatchet, our, our puzzle game, and uh, on whether or not we should bring it to Steam. And we never did. We still kind of talk about it. But it was one of those things where like, I don't know, Steam, Steam gamers, they don't really like, you know, those kind of puzzle games or whatever. I was like, I don't know if that's true. I think Steam is such a large platform that I think any kind of game, as long as it's a, of good quality and uh, you can get it in front of people would probably have some modicum of success, I would think. Um, but I don't know. I mean, you've released several games on Steam. Have you noticed that there's a trend on the types of games that tend to do well? Yeah. The, like, for, from, like, yeah, to, of course, you know, you get your AAA that, like, of course, does really well on Steam, you know, as, as, as well as on consoles, but yeah, that um, kind of building and simulation does really seems to do really well on Steam. Um, puzzle, yeah, the puzzle games, like you say, they kind of have their niche market. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, the the only game I've I've actually released on Steam has been uh, Prepare for Warp uh, so far, um, with the the Hoarder Two coming out. So. Um, a lot of my other games uh, I've released on uh, other platforms, like on uh, mobile, you know, uh, and for uh, old uh, web browser-based games, like out on Congregate and such. Oh yeah, um, Congre good old Congregate. Yeah, that that Congregate would, is somewhere where that you know, puzzle game would have done like really well uh, if that was yeah. still around, and that that market is kind of like gone to ground. For a long time, it sort of probably resurface, yes, you know, at some point in these next few years. Because, you know, everything, these things are always kind of cyclical. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there always is a gap in, um, again, discoverability. Maybe there's a, another platform that can come out that is more focused on a particular genre of game where it becomes easier to, because a lot of it's about community building, right? Like, People will go right. to people will go to the place where they feel like they can coordinate and interact with other people that share similar interests and find. Um, I mean, hell, that's why I created Game Club. That's why I created Music Club, where I post an, an album every week because I just wanted to be introduced to new stuff. Uh, and I found that, like, you know, like I listen to Spotify, but the Spotify, whatever it's called, like the weekly picks or whatever. I just found I kept it's it's like the same bands and same songs keep getting thrown into my weekly mixes. I was like, I want some, I want some new stuff, but I want to, I want to be able to like get weird without it, like completely destroying the algorithm. And then they send me all sorts of like crazy things. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe we need a, a game, a game marketplace for specific styles or genres uh, of games. I don't know. Right. Tom, Tom's in our audience. Tom, get working on that. Go make that for us. Yeah. I kind of find something that appeals to that right demographic. Because yeah, from uh, from what I understand, like that whole like puzzle game demographic and everything, that's that's going to be kind of like older audience, you know, kind of more um, gender like neutral or trending toward uh, female audience for, for those types of games, mm -hmm. um, as, as as opposed to like other like more popular, you know, but kind of unfortunate, but like more popular markets still tend to be geared very much toward you know a very like 18 to 35 male audience. Sure. Yeah. I, I, uh, many years ago I gave a TEDx talk, um, and I talked about, 
games industry and video games and how I, I firmly believe that video games are the next uh, big storytelling medium for humanity and that it's becoming a part of it's not becoming it, it is a part of human culture now just like music and movies and it's 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 a big part of where we will go as a civilization in my humble opinion uh but one of the people one of the other speakers that i was talking to she pretty much told me that she's like i don't get video games i don't like them i think they're stupid and a waste of time and i was like well first of all i don't know why you're bringing this to my attention like five minutes before I'm about to go on stage and give a TEDx talk. So thank you. But the, the thing I asked her about was, uh, I asked her, do you like, do you like movies? Do you consider movies an art form? And she kind of thought about it for a second. She's like, yeah. And I was like, well, would you consider movies an art form? If all you knew about movies was the ads you saw on TV. And she sort of took a second and she's like, yeah, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. And that was kind of my thing about video games is when you think about the gaming industry, and I have to remind my students of this all the time, that like my students at Columbus State that are taking a game design career, they're, they're trying to get a degree, that's not the common market, right? That, that's a biased market towards video games. Common, you know, just the, the normal video game player they might buy a PlayStation. They're going to buy like one to three games a year. It's usually going to be like something like Call of Duty, maybe like Madden or NBA 2K, and then maybe whatever the big game is for that year. Uh, people like us, like we kind of understand the nuance and all the different ways in which games are, are cool, but most people just don't think about the games industry in that way, right? And they don't see... Right. They don't see what games can be capable of. Uh, and back to the, the, the point that you mentioned, the only ads they see are from AAA game studios, right? Which sure. tend to be big things like Call of Duty. Uh, a lot of people running around and shooting and explosions and, and whatever. Um, and so I think that colors the, the just general market of, of the games industry. Um, and that can be a hard thing to kind of overcome too for us smaller developers i mean we can't we can't compete against a call of duty budget when it comes to advertising you know we're just like a drop um but if you had if you if you could if let's say d hoarder just does gangbusters and you've got all the money you don't need to worry about do you have like a project in the back of your mind that you would love to work on and maybe hire people for and that kind of thing yeah, I don't have anything bigger than D Hoarder 2 in mind right now, uh, specifically. Okay. Uh, wow, you, got, you know, so you are like laser focused on mine. Uh, but yeah, not nothing not uh, than, than D Hoarder 2 at the moment. That's, I mean, that's a big for, for being a, well, a, a solo proprietor as well as being like a small business owner, like staying focused on a project, you know. It's the running joke, right, in game devs where it's like they're excited about one project and then they work on it a while and then like, oh, they get excited by another thing and they work on it a while. Like having the follow through to finish a product from start to finish and get it out there, like a shipped title is worth like 10 non-shipped titles, no matter how good the ideas are. So that's pretty, that's pretty awesome, man. I'm glad that you, you've, you've got this down to a science, it sounds like. Now you just need the marketing, right? Right. Um, so we're getting, we got a little bit of time here, but, uh, one of the things that I'm curious about, we, we've been thinking a lot about, uh, or I have at least for pretty much since I started is how do we turn Columbus and Ohio and the Midwest? How do we make this place be a center for games development? That's, that's a drum I've been beating for a long time. It's part of the reason why GDEX exists. Um, it's part of the reason why, you know, I'm always reaching out to folks and going to um, other expos and conventions and stuff. Uh, and I'm just kind of curious, is that is that something you ever think about? Like, what if we could build a, a true games industry here in Ohio? If we could get, you know, maybe like an EA or an Ubisoft or someone to 
set down some roots here. Is that is that ever something you you think about or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that'd be great. Uh, that would be great. And, you know, that's kind of one of the reasons why you know, I really love that you're involved in the industry here in town because I know you've had that vision for such a long time of you know, time making Central Ohio into that. <clears throat> You know, and you've planted so many seeds of it, uh, you know, through like the, you know, Central Ohio, you know, kind of, you know, fostering the Central Ohio game dev group and, you know, kind of, um, you know, the early involvement with that. And uh, also with like the GDEX and, you know, kind of with uh, the, the, your involvement with uh, Game U uh, also kind of growing the talent yeah. here locally and everything, because that's a big component. I mean, you, you need to have the talent to, <laughs> for a big, you know, studio to hire so I yeah yeah totally i i think and this is something um that we occasionally run into where I, we have a couple big projects um in in the works kind of behind the scenes that we're, we're attempting to work on and trying to find the right type of talent for a particular project or role uh, I, I always try to keep it within Ohio if I can. And I've got, you know, lots of contacts and friends I can reach out to to help me try to find people. Uh, but the reality is, is that there's just, there's not as many people here in the Midwest that are on that like middle high to triple A studio experience level. And so it can take, it can take some, I, I got to kick over like a lot of rocks to find somebody or we have to go outside of the state to find folks. But I do find it really funny that like, I am consistently surprised and I don't know why I'm surprised about how many people have like an Ohio or at least a Midwest connection. Like when I go out to San Francisco to GDC or something, the number of people that are just like, oh yeah, I used to you know, live in Cincinnati or I was, you know, I worked in Dayton for five years or whatever, and then I moved out to uh, California. And they're like, oh, man, I would love to move back to, you know, the Midwest and work if there was a job available. So it seems like there's like a desire to do it. But w when you're trying to think about the big projects, um, you just need to bring on people to have the experience, right? Right. And, and it's it can be a, a hard find, um, which is why I'm, I'm glad that there's folks like you that are i mean you are you have taken the step for games being your primary thing which we said at the start of the show is a scary scary place to be whenever you're starting your own business um but i mean you're one of the people that keeps contributing to the community um you were one of the earliest and longest sponsors and exhibitors for gdex um you're always you're always one of the people i was like we're, we're doing gdex are you in you're like yeah i'm in like sweet uh so i'm i'm really grateful and appreciative uh, uh of that but do you think you do you see smiling cat being something where you are going to grow in people over time or do you just kind of like being a solo guy uh it would be my it would be my hope uh, to be able to get there uh, eventually um yeah right now um yeah, just kind of trying to get to you know, the, the business to the point where it's uh, stable to the point where I actually can bring someone on payroll. Yeah, it it takes a while. I was I was chatting. I don't know how this came up, but I was talking to. Oh no, it was with um, Jordan Fair, who I had on the show a couple weeks ago, and we were chatting. I was like, when I first started Multivarious, and we started doing it full time, we were paying ourselves twenty four thousand dollars a year each. And that was like, that was before taxes and everything. That was like our main salary. Um, and I am, I am surprised that we are able to kind of survive and, and push through on that for so long. Uh, but it just, you know, it took a while to kind of get that engine. And again, this was 2012, 13 and 14, like the first few years of starting. So things like virtual reality didn't really exist. You know, Oculus, it was all dev kits and betas at that point. And people didn't really understand gaming or game techniques or gamification. The app store was still kind of new. So most of the time I spent was just trying to like 
convince people, show people, you know, what you can do with interactive design and how you can use apps to do whatever. Um, and like, I think back now we make more than $24,000 a year. We don't make nearly as much as we should still, but we make more than 24 grand a year. Uh, but just building that foundation in Ohio, it's taken a long time to get folks on board. Um, so I feel your, I feel your struggle, Duke. I know, I know what it's like to get, get folks. Well, who do you think your, uh, what would your first hire be position wise? Who do you think you need to help you with? Like another programmer, an artist, well, let's say not yeah, a marketer. <laughs> not no, besides marketing. Okay. Yeah. yeah probably, marketing. yeah, probably the, uh, side on it. Um, there's so, someone who could be, you know, versatile between 3d and 2d artwork be someone i would look for yeah yeah i think the nice thing about uh having a couple degree granting uh universities here in ohio is that there's generally a fair number of 3d artists and like 3d generalists that that come out of the schools which is nice um but but saying that uh, along the same lines i've actually been very i don't want to say surprised but um over the past couple of years, a lot of folks that are in our game dev community have ended up getting roles at places like Rockstar and Naughty Dog and Bungie. And um, so it seems like people are starting to eyeball Ohio a little bit. So they're, they're, they're taking our folks, which is good. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah. Hold on. I, give me one second. I thought I might have had a question here on... Oh, we got somebody mentioning about uh, indie breakthroughs um, and how general folks in the game space, oftentimes they, they don't know that games could be like this when thinking about like indie games and the type of experiences you get. Uh, and meanwhile, the rest of us are over here like, yeah, how's it going? Um, what, what are your thoughts on just the, the, the types of games we're starting to see now outside of the AAA space, the kind of experiences we're starting to see? Yeah, I, I think it's great. I think it's needed. Um, yeah, you can't. I mean, you can't release like have like ten thousand, fifteen thousand games released a year and have them be all from the same cookie cutter templates. Um, you're just going to oversaturate the uh, industry like that. And so, yeah, it's great to see you know kind of branching out into new gameplay experiences and stuff. And it's that's going to be where the real innovation is. Um, you know, in the first games, it, it, it you know, may not be the ones that really make it on those advances, but, you know, we always build off of our innovations, kind of refine them and, you know, kind of perfect the formula. So totally, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very curious about, uh, Ubisoft. They, they made that statement, like, I don't know, it was a month ago or something about how they're, reworking i'm paraphrasing here but they're reworking their design philosophies around their games and i think they're going to try to make like more uh i don't want to say structured games but more like kind of focused games and particular styles and genres which i'm interpreting to be and maybe i'm off here but like they've been ubisoft has been running with the pretty much the same design template for their games for the past 15 years since like pretty much like Assassin's Creed 2 really kind of brought that in there. Big maps and a lot of like little things to do on the map and a lot of repeating, like take this thing from here to there. Um, and it feels like on the, on the game design front, we've moved past that in a lot of ways. Like, you know, how many rat pelts do you really need to go and collect in a game anymore? Uh, so I, I'm curious if if it seems like the big studios are acknowledging what you just said about the sort of templatized game designs. I, but I, what I'm curious about is, is a company like Ubisoft, as large as Ubisoft, are they going to be able to steer that ship to do it or not? They may want to do it, but I don't know if they have the sort of internal wherewithal to try really weird stuff. That I, I gonna... think it depends on whether their management can trust their talent to deliver it yeah uh really at, at the end of the day um really like the best 
the best companies creatively, you know, that have made the most like the companies like Pixar, you know, have been the ones that like trust their talent to to tell them, you know, how how things should be done. That I mean, that's that's a great way of putting it. Um, we've seen we've seen some companies, uh, or even just like single player. I mean, you and I are old enough to to remember when uh like early 2000s everyone was like single player games are dead it's all multiplayer it's all going to be you know and now of course we've got battle royales are kind of the the newest form of of that but for the longest time the, the common consensus was like even single player games have to have a multiplayer component and so you'd have all these games with like these terrible multiplayer additions Every once and again, you get something cool like uh, The Last of Us, the factions multiplayer is really cool. Um, but most of the time, the multiplayer stuff is not very good when it comes to the single player games. But uh, I, I think we've seen a lot. That's just not true anymore. Like I think uh, The Witcher 3, I think, really showed that people want strong single player experiences. Um, and that was a result of a company... You know, they may have stumbled with uh, Cyberpunk pretty hard, but CD Projekt Red created a great game with The Witcher 3 that they took two games to build on top of. Uh, Naughty Dog, I think, is one of those companies, like you said, that Sony Sony trusted them to do something weird with The Last of Us, and it ended up really working for them. And now we... I mean, how many single-player games do we see now? Uh, God of War is about to come out next month. Spider-Man, like, Cyberpunk. There's all these these games... Um, that are based on trusting the talent to do it. Right. And that's a, yeah, that's a really, really well, uh, good insight there. So do you think Ubisoft can do it? <laughs> do you have faith? Uh, well, well, we'll have to see. Like I said, it depends how, how much uh, faith they put in their talent and you know, how much they want to try to you know, like control things instead and try to like follow what's been done before yeah um so we're getting a little tight on time i, I want to my last question i kind of want to ask you is just as somebody who is stepping into the realm full-time like where do you think where do you think the games industry is going and what has you excited about the the future of the games industry well i mean we're kind of you know Kind of what's uh, exciting is we're kind of seeing this blending with all like real time rendering and everything, where games are starting to enter the realm where they can provide interactive experiences that visually are as rich as watching a movie. Um, you know, and it you know, remains to see if like the you know the storytelling can keep up with that and everything. Uh, but yeah, that's one aspect. And yeah, just seeing where also like this, the formalization we're starting to see around gameplay and, you know, kind of um, categorizing elements of gameplay and such like that, that that's another uh, really exciting area too, uh, where we can actually like formalize the knowledge and, and, and you know, teach future generations about it uh, without just saying, we'll do what we do. Yeah. One of, the, one of the things I'm really excited about, and this might be up your alley as someone who likes sort of simulations and stuff, is uh, I'm, I'm hoping, like, we, we have been on this graphics kick for 40 years since the, the dawn of video games. Um, and, you know, now we're in 4K world. 4K adoption on TVs is still pretty small. Uh, so most people don't have 4K TVs, and now people are talking about 8K TVs. And I was like, whatever, dude. Like, let's hang out in 4K world for a while. Um, but as computers are getting more and more powerful, I'm hopeful that we kind of hit some, some space where instead of focusing all of our efforts and, uh, performance or whatever on the graphics side, I really want to see what powerful machines can do with things like AI, like character and combat AI and NPC AI, or what kind of interesting, I don't know, multiplayer or like synchronous fighting systems can we create by diverting the efforts that we spend on graphics every year, put a little of that towards some really interesting, uh, like I said, 
AI and stuff. I, it'd be really cool. What kind of like simulation stuff can we do with these more powerful systems? That's that's something I'm really exciting to, excited to see. All right, and also what that would mean for like an open world game, yep. where I mean, you could literally program the AI to generate infinite content, and it would actually all coherently make sense. You know, unlike a lot, you know, a lot of procedurally generated worlds, it just kind of they, they, eventually any procedurally generated world, unfortunately, kind of ends up just looking like it's repeating a template. But with an AI, that wouldn't necessarily be so. Yeah. I, I actually that that's a really good point because I think that's one of the uh one of the areas where um just open world like the size of the open worlds starting from Grand Theft Auto 3 it, it was just like every time it's like this world's 50% bigger than the previous game and it twice as the size I think we've all kind of realized that like at some point we don't need the world to be gigantic let's shrink the world size and do more interesting things within that space so I think that's very similar to the graphics thing where it's like, okay, we don't need 8K visuals. Let's stop at 4K or 1440p or whatever, and let's see what interesting things we can do within that that framework. Um, but yeah, I I agree. I, I I I we're already starting to see some cool stuff, and the the indie scene is obviously always doing neat stuff. That was what was brought up earlier in our our Discord group. Uh, by the way, you can also join us at volpecreates.com slash discord if you want to join our discord channel. But, um, but I, I really, I was blown away. I don't know if you've played the last of us part two yet, but I was blown away by the enemy AI in that and how it integrates with, um, accessibility. Like there are the accessibility features in that game are just like insane including you can set up the AI so it, it never does things like it won't flank you or it'll come up behind you. If you're somebody that maybe doesn't want to be surprised or somebody that maybe doesn't have like super fast reflexes, it'll always keep the enemies within your visual space, which is like, that's amazing. The fact that you can, you can fine tune the enemy AI that much, uh, I think is a, is a big step towards doing some really interesting things um in the in the ai space so i don't know that's my hope i want to see and yeah i would love to see more um more dynamic involved open worlds that aren't just these giant spaces you walk through um and there's interesting things going on i think the witcher 3 does some cool stuff uh but yeah right and I don't, and that's where i think ai could help like you said like the space doesn't necessarily need to be bigger but it does need to be richer um, and an AI yeah. could help, you know, provide that richness, have like events, you know, events occurring, like, you know, maybe, you know, maybe these two NPCs run through here where they, you know, run through here this day where they never have before and never will again. Yeah. Whereas with like something like uh, Stardew Valley or whatever, it's like, yeah, the NPCs have like variations and stuff like that, but it's all kind of set in stone what those variations are. We uh, we had a game that uh, was one of my my ideas that we kind of designed and tinkered behind the scenes at Multivarious that we never announced or did anything with and maybe someday we'll do something, uh, but it involved a lot of like really interesting AI components that uh, I think every time I told Tom about one of them he just looked at me like oh my god you're a madman, but um, I I think there's a lot of there's a lot of space to be uh, investigated in those kind of things. And particularly with indie games, the fact that, uh, you know, most indie studios, three, four, five people, maybe 10 people, they're not going to be able to create AAA level graphics anyway. So why bother? Why not try investing your efforts and time into something that could be a little more unique um, or tangible in a, in a different way. Um, but that's just my take, and, I, you know, what do I know, right? All right, well, I think we are, we're getting close to time. Is there anything else you would like to talk about before we wrap it up, Duke? I really appreciate you being on the show. Uh, no, I no. can't think of anything. You're feeling good? Uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, 
Everybody, this has been the Volpe Creates Show, the weekly talk show about gaming and creative technology. Thank you all for being a part of it. Duke, thank you so much for being on the show this week. Uh, I'm very grateful and appreciative, and hopefully we'll see you at uh, a GDEX again in the near future whenever we figure out when that date's going to be for 2023. We will let people know. Um, it's a, um, thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure to be here today and, uh, talk, and talk with you. Oh, my, my pleasure. Uh, so on behalf of myself, uh, Baby, Pumpkin, Mr. Lucas, and our guest, I want to thank you all for being a part of it. Remember that we are trying to, we've, we've had some um, scheduling snafus, but we try to be every Friday, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern on twitch.tv slash Volpe Creates. And then I also upload the videos to YouTube, which is also under Volpe Creates. So you can watch the previous episodes uh, of the show. But on behalf of uh, everyone, oh, yes, I don't forget, we got smilingcatentertainment.com. Are there other ways that people can get a hold of you? Um, if they want to? Uh, well, yeah, I'm always in the uh, COD Discord. Um, and I do have a, a channel on Twitch that I do visit periodically. Uh, yes, uh, Smiling Cat Entertainment or on Twitter, um, Smiling Cat OTD uh, would be the uh, two main ways. Awesome. Yeah, and for those interested, uh, COG has been brought up a few times. Uh, it's C O G G, so it's thecog.com, T H E C O G G.com. Uh, you can be a part of that. It's the Central Ohio Game Dev Group, but everyone's welcome. doesn't matter where you are in the world. Uh, you are welcome to join uh, and be a part of it. So, again, thank you, everyone. Uh, really appreciate you uh, being a part of the show, and we will see you next week.